gospel lesson appointed for today is in the chap in the Gospel of John, if you just flip a few pages beforehand, chapter 17, verses from 1 to 17. John's Gospel, chapter 17, verses from 1 to 17. After Jesus had spoken these words, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, so that the Son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all people, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him to him. And this is eternal life, that they might know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me, I have given to them, and they have received them, and know in truth that I came from you. And they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one, as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them in your name that you have given me. I guarded them, and not one of them was lost, except the one destined to be lost, so that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and I speak these things in the world, so that they may have my joy made complete in themselves. I have given them your word, and the word world has hated them because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I am not asking you to take them out of the world, but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. They do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. Sanctify them in the truth, for your word is the truth. Here ends the gospel acquainted with today. Please pray with me. Come down, Holy Spirit. Come down in tongues of fire. Tongue, come down in rays of light. Open our hearts. Stretch our imagination. And give us a vision that the word we hear and the word that is preached may become the true living word. Amen. A few good years ago, um, it was my last year of high school, and I was preparing um, for my entry exams to law school. And there was a song, a pop song, that for many days stayed on the pop charts. Now, unlike the most number one hits you hear these days, it did not actually have a great beat, the beat you wanted to, you know, break up and dance to. But it was a slow, melancholy tune that invited the listeners more to a reflection than a dance, which is something I really like. Now, like I said, I was studying for the entry exams, and let me tell you, any chance I had to break from my study was good enough for me. So, I distinctly remember the first time I heard the song and really listened to it. Um, words. In case some of you remember, it was by Joan Osborne, One of Us. 
and the coarse lyrics ran like these. What if God was one of us? Just a slob like one of us? Just a stranger on a bus trying to make his way home? Back to heaven, all alone. And they say pop culture is not profound. What if God was one of us? Today we celebrate the ascension of the Lord. Now, unlike with most church holidays, there seems to be a lot of confusion about what this event is really about. Before I came to the States, I lived in the Netherlands, and we actually got two days off. Ascension is actually celebrated on Thursday, so we got Thursday and Friday off. So, we got two days off, but hardly anyone knew what it was about. For most people, Ascension meant that big extended holiday where they can book four days in Spain or in Italy. <laughs> now, when my peers at the law faculty discovered that I actually was a churchgoer, I became, and half of them were sons of the man's, I actually became the token person they could ask any religious question, assuming I would know what Ascension was about and why is it so fabulous that we get two days off. I never figured the two days off thing, but let me tell you, Ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ is the time we really close in on the season of Easter. For 40 days, and if you remember, 40 is a symbol of fulfillment, of wholeness, of a lifetime. For 40 days after his resurrection, Jesus has appeared at numerous occasions to his disciples. On this Sunday, he bids them farewell. And we are told he ascended into heaven. Within two weeks, sorry, within a week, he will send down on his disciples the Holy Spirit. That will be Pentecost. And from that time on, we will return to the ordinary time. Easter and all the wisdom it had to impart will be over. It will be time to move on with our Christian and church lives, with the teachings of Christ, now in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Now, Ascension is so important that it was actually one of the earliest holidays that was celebrated by Christians. It even made it into the Nicene and Apostles' Creed. If you remember, when we say, He ascended into heaven, we are talking about the ascension. Yes, but that still does not tell us much about the ascension itself. Well, for one thing, it does not mean that Christ is sitting on a cloud and dangling his feet and peeking down and seeing what we are doing or what his faithful are up to. It is a cute version. But it is not the idea behind the celebration. And in fact, from very early on, Christians struggled to say and to define what the ascension really meant. Notice that today's passage in Luke is very, very brief. The disciples ask about the end times, and Jesus responds that it is not for them or for anyone else to know when the end times will happen. And then he is immediately taken up to heaven, with the disciples watching it. Again, not much detail, but the author moves then on immediately to describe the Pentecost. Though Jesus is taken up to the Father, the Holy Spirit will descend in tongues of fire, and the disciples will not be left alone. Now, today's passage in John's Gospel is really interesting. Now, you might recall that John is the last of the four Gospels to be have written. It was written around the year 100 AD, tradition would tell us, by the disciple John himself. Now, unlike the three other Gospels, this one is not concerned with a meticulous account of Jesus' day-by-day journey. It is rather a theological tree. John had... John knew the other three Gospels. It's very clear he didn't know them. He was acquainted with them, but he had time to reflect. And what he writes as the Gospel of John is this big hymn to Christ. If you remember, the Gospel of John begins, In the beginning there was word. It is a poem. It is a beautiful, written in the best Greek in the New Testament. 
Testament. It is a beautiful poem about Christ. It is a theological hymn. And the aim of the Gospel of John is not history, but he's writing these things as he himself says, so that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and so that through believing him, you might have life in his name. And so today's passage is an end of a very, very long last speech of Jesus that is in this Gospel. It is fascinating. Unlike all the other Gospels, it does not portray the disciples as the people who did not get it. In this passage, Jesus prays for them, and by proxy for you all who believe, that they might be one with God and in God. Imagine, the only begotten Son prays for them and prays for you. The Savior of the world intercedes for his disciples that God may protect them, that God might protect you. So, what if God was one of us? Well, the Christian teaching reminds us, and we have lived through that in Easter, that God was one of us. God came down from heaven became vulnerable as a baby, lived, grew up, and then lived and loved amongst us. He knew our joys and sorrows. He then gave up his life willingly for us and for our salvation, and was killed on a cross and left to die alone. And three days later, he rose again from the dead and gave life to all those in the tomb. Now this same God ascends into heaven. And what the church is trying to say today, perhaps in a very clumsy way, after all, we are the church, is that with the resurrected Christ, Christ's story is taken up to God and is with God. And in Christ, so are all your individual stories. The ones you do share with others and the ones you hide because they pain or they bleed too much. God is not all alone in heaven, but is there with you and your life. And in Christ they are a part of God and they make God happy and sometimes they make God sad. All our lives are with God and in God. And God is working somehow in God's only way to redeem what needs redeeming, even if we think it is beyond hope. And perhaps some things are beyond our hope, but they are never beyond the grace or the hope of God. Just think about it. Your joys, your fears, and your sorrows are with God and dear to God. Imagine what that means. Imagine what God must feel when God sees all the pain caused by war, by hunger, by poverty, by hatred. Imagine what God feels when God looks down and sees all the victims of injustice. Imagine what God feels when God looks down on you and see you in pain or in suffering. God has a history. It is the history of Christ. And by virtue of your baptism, in Christ, with Christ, and through Christ, God's history is also your history. And because of that, on the day of ascension, we are being reminded that we need not to worry. Death, sin, and evil have already been defeated on Easter. Now we are being taught that, what we, that we can do the things we need to do or the things that need to be done because God knows our troubles and feels our pain and is working, actively working to redeem it all in God's own time. We might stumble. 
be set back in the short term, but in the long term, in Christ, the future belongs to God and to God alone. We might work against poverty and hunger because we know that they have been defeated. And so we can do it with courage. We might call for love and compassion for all people because we know that in Christ, love and compassion has been shown to all. And love has already said the last word. And in our small perspective today, we can all step into the unknown, you and I perhaps, because we trust that our future is ultimately in God's hands, and we not need to worry or fret, for what is to come is already with God, and all we have to do is to live in the covenant with each other and with God together. So if you are asked like I was by people, what is Ascension all about? Tell them this. It is a day when we are reminded by God that we are closer to God's heart than we could ever imagine or hope for. And because of that, we can live generously boldly and with confidence that nothing in this world or in any other world can separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ. Now, if you need a one-liner, try this. Ascension is what the theologian Irenaeus of Leon once summed up in this way. The glory of God is revealed in a human being living fully, and a human fully alive is a being that is the vision of God. Do not worry. Christ has ascended into heaven and has your history in his hand. Amen. Let us spend a few moments in the quietness of our